People ask me all the time, how did you become a magician? It's certainly not the most common job. As a matter of fact, when I'm out in the grocery store and I tell people I am a magician, they quite often think I'm joking. But interestingly enough, I actually started doing this because I was inspired at the age of five by a babysitter. Uh, the babysitter was very talented and he would come to our house every week uh, bringing in new amazing miracles to show me. And I actually started taking it very seriously and from this age of five to approximately 13 years of age, I actually spent hours and hours rehearsing and practicing these little routines. And I think what I always loved about it was just the joy that I brought people. So watching their natural reactions. Now, honestly, I didn't ever think I'd become a full-time magician. This was a hobby, I had great interest in it. But then, as life went on, I discovered it again later in life that this was a passion. And I said, you know what, maybe, maybe I too could make a living being a magician. So I decided to just take a leap of faith. And I quit that corporate job, walked away from it entirely, and started doing magic full time. Now this is 23 years ago, and that journey has been amazing. But uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend everyone, you know, to become a magician. It is something you have to have passion for. If you don't have the passion, you're not gonna put in the time that's required to kind of get you to the level that you need to be to where you're exceeding the expectations of people. Uh, people don't have a lot of references, honestly, for magic, whether maybe they've just seen it on TV or they saw David Copperfield in Las Vegas, but you have to find your own spot. And then by finding your own niche, you kind of can really focus on that and uh, make that your journey. Well, my name's Peter Morrison. I am a magician, and this is Keynotes. So let's say you've taken the, the big step, and you've determined magic is for me. I, I want to become a magician. How do I go about doing that? Well, the baseline has to be in practice. Now people really, I always find the easiest way to explain to them what that kind of figure, what it looks like, it would be just like if you want to play the guitar. If you want to play the guitar, if you want to be you know, Van Halen, it's going to take you years and years of practice to get to that level. Now there, is some, there are some people and uh, you know, they're just born with a little bit of natural talent, but it does take literally thousands of hours. I think we've all heard that term, the 10,000 hour rule. Well, I would say it's accurate. To really master something, it takes about 10,000 hours. I mean, even at the simplest thing, a deck of cards. Now, when you think of a deck of cards, you think of the game you play with your folks around the table. You know, mom's dealing you in on a game of uh, Uno or something like that. But to be able to actually take the cards and do simple little things like this. It looks simple, but believe it or not, I probably spent two years working just on how to fan the cards. And then I took another couple of years and decided that would be fun to add to the mix as well. So when you see these sorts of things in magic, quite often our goal is to make it look easy. It's just like the person who plays the guitar on the stage. It's effortless. How are they able to bend the notes so perfectly? How is he able to make that girl vanish? Well, there may be a little bit more to making a girl vanish than a deck of cards. <laughs> but all of it requires time, practice, and rehearsal. Now, the reason why this is so important is you have to have that baseline. If you don't have the baseline of the skill when it comes to actually learning magic, you know, looking at a YouTube video, looking at a video, uh, a DVD, going to a, a seminar. We actually have seminars for magic. They exist. Society of American Magicians, International Brotherhood of Magicians, which actually was founded by Harry Houdini. But without that baseline of skill, you're gonna read these books or watch a video, 
and it's not going to make any sense to you because you don't know the fundamentals. But once you have those fundamentals, what's amazing is you're able to do something that no one else can do. No one knows how to, you can do it because, well, they don't have that skill set. And that is exactly why magicians don't tell you how it works. So the practice, again, is so fundamental, really not just to magic, really any, any form of entertainment, work, it all really is rather the same. But if you want to be a master of it, I'm going to have to say you're going to have to go all in and practice like I used to practice, which was probably eight or ten hours a day, uh, seven days a week. But it never seemed like it was a struggle because, you know, I loved it that much. And I could see in my mind the, the end goal. I could see by spending that amount of time, I could create this miracle a miracle that would defy explanation. And that's always the most important thing in magic, to really not fool the audience, to entertain the audience, and to mystify the audience in an amazing way. One of the most important things that I think that people can overlook is defining their character. Um, it's something that's very, very important in magic because when you're performing a routine, it's gotta make logical sense to the audience. Uh, now, for me, thankfully it was rather easy. Um, I've always been kind of a preppy guy and I like old school stuff, so this kind of classic dress, it made sense for me. But when I identify the character, I was also thinking about the kinds of routines that I would have that would be structured around the character. So if you notice around me there's different props, well the props kind of fit the story. So when someone's looking at their character, like who they want to be, there's kind of two choices. You can either create a character, and I have met magicians like this in the past where literally on stage they are a completely different person than they are in person. Uh, one of my favorite magicians of all time uh, was a guy in, in a show called The Carnival of Wonders. And in the show, he's just kind of gleeful, dancing around, just really silly person. But in person, he was very serious. So this is kind of one route you can go. You could say, you know, I really like this kind of a character. And it's somewhere in you that maybe there is a little of that actual person that you don't really let out in, your, in the public eye normally. So you can define and create that character and it makes sense, and that's who you become. So when people think of hiring you or if you created your own show, that, that is what they're getting. But I think for most people, it's better to find who you are, whether it be the silly geek, the guy who's the happy, jovial, uh, in my case, traditional style, and then really in embracing that and then trying to find a way of creating a show that, again, where it all kind of makes sense. You know, uh, again, if I were doing something kind of silly and hokey, it wouldn't necessarily fit my character, and therefore it wouldn't really make sense to the audience when they're watching. But I think this is something, again, that can be overlooked very easily, but it's so important uh, in the evolution of someone trying to become a magician. So now you have to build a show, and this is a tricky thing. You think about all the tricks you see on YouTube and all the different things you've seen on television. Well, in many cases, these are things that are very unique to that individual. So what I have always found is there's the beginning, there's a middle, and there's the end to any performance. And this is the best way to frame it, in my opinion. So the beginning of my show, as an example, it's yeah, it's really kind of based in co comedy. So you have classic comedy, but it's mixed with classical magic. Classical magic is a style of magic that is more, let's say, skill-based. So I don't have the big giant boxes out. I'm not sawing women in half, although it is pretty cool to do. 
But you know, this would be kind of a starting point in my show. And the reason why I think having something lighter up front is so important is you're getting the audience laughing. You want people to laugh. When people are laughing and they're smiling, well, they're laughing and smiling with you. You've elicited that from them. So now, the middle, you've got some, free, you got some free room. You're now the whole center section of your show. Now, the center section of my show uses a lot of different kind of, what I like to say are interesting props. And I think that's important when you're developing a show as well. You know, things that have a little bit of intrigue. This has been out during, let's say, my entire performance, but now it's being introduced. And now that I'm giving a reason why it's here. So what's great about that, you're telling the story throughout your show and people can't help but gaze at what's being displayed before them. Like, what, what is he going to do with that? Now also, a big part of that show development is understanding who are you going to use in your show? This particular routine is actually one of my absolute favorites. It happens to do with uh, mentalism and mind reading. So you're guessing the numbers that an individual chooses. But when you're making that selection of who that person is, what you want to have is that person who's the happy, jovial type, ideally. I mean, if you get someone up who's really analytical, well, they're all they're going to be thinking about is how does it work? How does it work? So again, what this does in my show, though, by having this center section, which is really focused on something completely different, it keeps the attention of the audience. So the beginning, they may be thinking, wow, the whole show is going to be comedy. The whole show is going to be this kind of classical magic. And then, of course, you surprise them and you've changed directions. You've moved into something completely different. So now they're thinking, wow, I wonder what's coming next. Now, as far as, again, selecting the individual effects, those are going to be based, loosely based, on your character. But it's also going to be based on your skill level. Uh, let's just say you don't have time, like I did, to spend eight hours a day practicing, and now you're up to 2,000 hours of practice. Well, there are going to be certain things that you just technically can't do. So one of the routines that I have in my show is an example. I, honestly, I think I spent eight years working on it before it was actually ever introduced into my show. So now you've come up with this wonderful structure. You have your beginning, your middle, but the end. The end is your hook. You have to somehow, again, surprise your audience. So with my audience, most of the show's interactive. And so I'm a really big believer in not just audience participation, but making magic more than a trick. It is one of the performing arts. So the last section of my show, I would just describe it as beautiful. It's one of those things you're watching, you're amazed, uh, you, you can't help but you know, turn your gaze away from the stage because it's so captivating. And this is classical magic for me, which is that skillful magic orchestrated and choreographed in many cases to music. So whatever your style is, and whatever your show development is, if you want it to be just a straight fun show, that's fine. But you have to have these segments. You need to block it where it's not just one thing. It doesn't matter how good you are, you're gonna lose the focus of the audience. And I think this is one of the fundamental, most important things you can do is keep people guessing. And always, most importantly, that you've heard it all before, you always wanna leave your audience wanting just a little bit more, which means you've done your job right. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about production, which consists of music and lighting. This is something we can easily overlook. As a matter of fact, I have actually talked to some magicians who've said, well, my music is the applause of the audience. Well, that same individual now uses lighting and music in their show. <laughs> we talked about it extensively. But reason why is two things. Number one, music for me, it elicits emotion. 
So if I hear a song, it, it creates a, an experience, it creates a moment, it creates an emotional reaction. And when you're combining that with something visually exciting, well that brings out the best in people. They, they feel a connection to it. This is why you know, when you're picking the music too, I suggest you try to pick things that are really make sense with your character. Now, I don't go straight classical music, otherwise my entire audience would be asleep. But I do try to find things that make sense with my character. So you've made your great music selections. Hopefully they make sense with your show. And the only way you're gonna find out is by trial and error. Also, if you notice, pretty easy to see on a stage like this. Well, there's a reason why, it's because I have theatrical lighting. Now, different skin tones also make a big difference with what kind of lighting you're going to use. And if you're not familiar with how to do it yourself, thank God we all have YouTube. <laughs> Just go on YouTube and you can kind of learn about it. Or if you have the means, hire someone to help uh, create your personal color palette. Because every person's a little bit different. And lighting, even in the smallest of settings, and I know that you're not gonna probably be carrying in giant lighting cans with you and boards of wash to illuminate your space at your shows at, let's say, at someone's home. But talking to the person before you get there and asking those environmental questions, do you have control over the lighting in the room? Do you have overhead lighting? Do you have lighting that where we could somehow direct it towards me. These are very important things, and I think we've all heard it before. Two of the most important elements in performance is being seen and being heard. And if they can't hear you or see you, well, that's gonna make a very, very challenging performance. But really, is for me, at this juncture, since I understand that, for me, it's an enhancement too. And a lot of times, I'll make very small tweaks to whether it be the musical track or the lighting. And also there's different apps, of course, we can use now or different softwares where maybe that song isn't just the right beat. Maybe it's just a little too fast. And you can take that song, compress it slightly, and now it's exactly what you're looking for. So if you have ever a uh, passion for finding that perfect piece of music and you feel you're so close, don't give up on it because you can actually probably make it exactly the way you want it to. And I have to say, I think in my show, every single piece of music has been edited to some degree to try to find that sweet spot where it makes sense, the timing's right, and even those little nuances like adding reverb or something to make it more euphoric in the song, uh, I think is enormously helpful. So hopefully you, when you're looking for lighting, you're looking for sound, go online, read about what's out there. And then of course, if you don't know uh, what to do and you're still a little stuck, talk to those who've done it before you. I'm a big proponent in asking advice for those from those who've already done it before. Hopefully you found this very helpful and don't forget it because it is a super important element when you're creating your show, because you don't want it to just be a show, you want it to be a production. So here's the part you've all been waiting for. How do I make money as a magician? So your marketing should be really laser focused on what makes you different. You gotta have a price point that you feel honestly reflects where you're at in your journey. The last thing you want to do is come in and say, yeah, um, $10,000 to do a magic show, but the client's really not very happy with your performance. If it's $10,000 and they absolutely love you, well, that's great news for you because you've just hit a very high mark as far as fees for magicians. <laughs> but the, the key with your marketing is it's got to make sense. But in my opinion, the best way a magician can get hired is to be in front of people actually in a live performance setting. So the best place to do this is actually to find local restaurants or breweries or other venues where they're open to this idea of how can they make their guest experience special. Again, it's about separating yourself from the competition. 
by creating something that people can't overlook. And I think once you've done that and you've separated yourself, you know what, people are more apt to go your direction when it comes to hiring you. This is the hardest part of the business because it is the business. So I think one of the most common questions I get asked, all the time actually, do you ever get nervous? Well, today I don't get nervous, but I can tell you right now when I first did those early shows, I was very nervous. And the reason why, it takes time to build confidence. You, do, you build confidence by getting not just positive feedback from your audience, but just knowing what you're doing in your show. You've built a show and you've got these three segments now. And when you really know where you're going, even if something throws you a curveball, because it's gonna happen, you know, you could have the lights go out in the building or the guy in the front row yells something out, but you're gonna be confident because you know your script, you know your outline, and you know where you're gonna be going throughout that conversation, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. You know you're not gonna be dropping things on the ground <laughs> like you did when you're practicing at home. So confidence is something that comes with time, and I think that it will just continue to build and build. The more you practice, the more that you rehearse, the more that you perform, that confidence will come naturally. And thankfully for me, it seems to just keep getting a little bit better each and every day. It's been such a pleasure spending time with you all today. And so one of the questions that might be crossing your mind is, what is magic? What, if you were to define magic, what is it? Well, magic is the ability of the performer to create the illusion of what magic would actually look like. Now, it might be as simple as something like this. Just being able to move the cards in a way that in themselves look magical. When people see this sort of thing, of course, they can't help but direct their gaze to it. But the art of magic's been around for a very, very long time. And really, again, all it is, it's the actor portraying the role of someone who can do impossible things. Now, Hopefully, you've spent all this time practicing like we discussed earlier, so you're going to have a skill set that other people just don't have. And when they're watching you perform, as much as they'd like to, hopefully, there's no way that they can actually see what you're doing. But this is why, as I mentioned recently in our conversation, doing those restaurants, going out and performing all of the time, you start to identify the angles that might be a problem. Because they're gonna be there, there's gonna be those moments where people are looking carefully and they go, I think I got it. And the problem with that is now it's no longer magic. It's just a trick. My goal as a magician is the magic I perform, I want it to really feel like it is magic, like it is a miracle of some kind. Not that I claim power. <laughs> and nor should you, but it's creating the optics that it feels real. And this is why places like Walt Disney and Disneyland and these places are so great, because you feel like you're taken to a different place. And when you go to these attractions, it's like, wow, I'm no longer in Anaheim or Orlando. I've gone to a different realm. And that's our job as magicians when creating magic is to bring people to a different place, but I think most importantly, it's to unlock that inner child in people. We all have it in us, and I think quite often we forget. We forget that inner child, and that's where I take great joy, is watching that grown adult sit there at my show, not knowing what to expect, and then to see that inner child come out I see it all the time and I just it's it's a wonderful thing 
And I think it's why I've chosen this route in life, to become a magician. For me, it was never for me. It's always been for the audience, to unlock that inner child, create those joyful moments, and to create an experience that hopefully will truly last them a lifetime. Funny enough, I've gotten over the years many, many hundreds of notes and emails and letters just saying, you know, how I was able to make their lives a little bit better. I can't think of anything greater I could do in the world than do exactly what I do today. And that is, be a magician.